Hello everyone, and welcome to my video for tips and tricks for Trial of the Grand Crusader. The video will have some general subjects that everyone can use for their raids, but most of it will be focused around the Affliction Warlock gameplay. In this video, I will cover the subjects of FAQ, the most asked questions I have gotten on stream about Trial of the Grand Crusader. After that, I will go through all 5 bosses from the Warlock point of view, and then finishing the bosses off with how you can parse in TOC with what counts and what doesn't count towards your parse. At the end of the video, I will show you guys the current business for Affliction Warlocks and why I personally won't be going for it together with my opinion on the biggest items you can go for first. The most asked question I've gotten on my Twitch stream is will we be able to enter heroic mode TOC from day one without doing normal mode first? The reason for this question is being that back in the day and I believe still on retail to this day, you need to do normal before you can do heroic. However, Blizzard have made the change for classic that 25 man normal and heroic share a lockout. And in doing that, they made the change that you don't need to do normal before you can enter heroic. So yes, we will be able to enter heroic mode right away. The second most asked question is how tier works in Trial of the Grand Crusader. In TOC, we now have three different versions of tier. We have 232 item level, 245 item level, and lastly 258 item level tier. The 232 item level tier can be acquired through just Emblems of Triumph. As you can see on the screen, it is 30 emblems for the gloves and shoulders and then 50 for the rest of the pieces. The 245 item level tier can be acquired from one trophy of the crusade per item and emblem of triumph. As you can see on the screen, it is now 45 emblems for the gloves and shoulders and then 75 for the remaining pieces. Trophy of the Crusade can be acquired in 10 man from the tribute chest at the end on heroic. And it can also drop from every boss on 25 man normal or heroic. Lastly, we have the 258 item level tier, the highest possible one. This tier can only be acquired from the 25 man heroic tribute chest. If you have at least one attempt remaining when you kill a noob, you get two tokens, and if you have at least 45 attempts remaining when you kill a noob, you get an additional two, giving you four 258 tokens in total. These tokens will drop like previous tiers, as in they will drop as Conqueror, Vanquisher, or Protector tokens, and not be universal like the Trophy of the Crusade. Right, let's get to what most of you are probably here for, the tips and tricks for each boss. The first encounter you have in TOC is the Beast of Northrend, and basically you have to fight three different bosses over three phases. The footage you see is recorded on my 10 plus year old computer before I got my new one, and that is why the quality might not be the best. I apologize for that. As a European, I was also playing on really high MS, which feels horrible for DOT classes, so don't be too harsh on my gameplay in this footage. The first phase, you are against Gormok the Impaler. In this phase, random patches of fire will spawn on players, while spreading out is advised so you have the minimum amount of movement. The boss will randomly spawn snowballed vassals that will jump to a random player and attack them and also periodically stun them and interrupt them. So if you do get jumped by a snowball, the best you can do is to go into melee so they can help cleave it down faster. The snowballed vassals are rather important to kill fast as they are annoying to have on you especially as a caster. So multi-dotting them and a couple of shadow balls to build shadow embrace stacks and refresh the corruption is advised here. However, when you go into melee we will have to deal with another mechanic from Gormok which is the stomp. Stomp will interrupt the cast of anyone within what is believed to be around 20 to 25 yards of him 
just like the Freya Stomp. However, this one is not unlimited range like the Freya one. For the pre-pot on this fight, as you can see in the current clip playing on your screen, I gain combat at around 9 seconds before DBM tells you combat starts. So that timer as of right now is not to be trusted. However, if you do pre-pot at 9 seconds right before the combat, it is still possible to get a snapshot on your corruption with a nice little tricks and a generous mage who might have scorched the boss for you instantly. That is basically all that is important to know as a caster POV in this phase. In phase 2, you face Acid, Maw and Dreadscale. The way my guild dealt with this boss on the PTR was to focus down Acid more first so we don't have to deal with the poison attack. How you do it in your guild is completely up to you. Obviously, as an Affliction Warlock, you want to be multi-dotting these two like you have been doing on bosses like Kologorn and Mimiron in Uldua. Full dots with the haunt on the primary target, all three dots and maintaining three Shadow Embrace stacks on the off target, the only reason not to do this is if your guild is very strict about purely focusing the main target with every single ounce of DPS you've got, but that is very bad from Reflection Warlock POV. In this phase, there's not too much to worry about as an Reflection Warlock perspective, other than being spread out since Dreadscale would do his flame attack on a random player, which then spreads to any other nearby player. And if you are stacking with other people who have this debuff, you will instantly kill each other off, so stay spread. Last thing I have for this phase is that dots will continue to tick while the two worms are burrowed. And the DBM timer for the burrow seems to be on point. So have your dots nicely refreshed before they go down and that will allow you to deal a great amount of damage. It is also possible to start a channel spell like Drain Soul and keep it going while they are underground. So if you're able to time that, you should do it even though Drain Soul doesn't deal much damage before 25%. It's better than not doing any damage with direct attacks during the downtime. For the last phase, you will be fighting Ice Howl. Ice Howl in itself is a fairly simple boss fight. He will periodically knock enemies back who are too close to him, but this only really affects pets as melee players can outrange it while still doing damage. He will occasionally do Arctic Breath that stuns everyone in a cone until the channel is over. Just like how the champion of Hodia works in the Hodia Tunnel of Uldua. So all casters and melee should spread out in a nice circle around him so you don't all get hit by the breath. What I am about to say next might be controversial and some people might disagree, but this is one of the few scenarios where it's okay to clip your dots and I'll explain why. This boss will occasionally jump into the middle of the arena, stun everyone and knock them to the wall and then charge a random player. The time between the stun and for him to hit the wall is as long as 11 to 12 seconds. So in my own opinion, and I might be proven wrong, it's fine to clip stuff like Unstable Affliction and Agony here if you have a very low duration left of it. Like for example one tick left on Unstable Affliction and clipping it with for example like 2.5 seconds left as Ice Howl is jumping into the middle. The reason I like this so much is Ice Howl is taking double damage while he is stunned by ramming into the wall. And instead of having to quote unquote waste time applying your dots on a boss that is currently taking double damage, you can be spamming Shadow Bolts into the boss instead while the dots you applied right before it charged will already be ticking for double damage instantly, as the double damage taken wor is working dynamically just like Curse of Elements would and so on. If you also get into a good situation where you can delay your haunt for a few seconds and not lose too much from it, you can refresh Haunt as the boss is jumping into the middle, so you ensure the Haunt debuff for the entire duration where you cannot be damaging the boss. And hopefully this will make you not lose your Shadow Embrace stacks as well. If the charge happens towards the other side of the arena as to where you are standing, it is easy to lose this stack. Rocket Boots is advised for this so you can re-haunt straight away and hopefully not lose the Shadow Embrace. Lastly, for Phase 3. Making good use of your demonic portal can give you great DPS here. Making a portal, for example, 30 yards to the right of where you're being knocked, 
makes it easy to escape the charge and makes it faster for you to get to the wall where he will be stunned as well. Now, that was quite a mouthful, but the first boss is kinda three bosses in one, so there is a lot to cover. Let's move on to the next boss of the raid. Lord Jaraxxus will be the second boss you encounter in TOC. And it's not a particular hard boss usually. On this boss, you want to spread out like phase 2 on the first boss, since Jaraxxus will occasionally do a chain lightning that will bounce with no limit to it. Jaraxxus will every 40 seconds get 10 stacks of a magic buff on himself that increases his damage done. This is spell stealable by the mages and usually you don't need to help purge it with your fell hunter. However, when the mages are at 10 stacks themselves, they only want to refresh the buff and keep blasting, while there will be stacks that need to be purged eventually, so having devour magic keybound for this boss will be helpful. Jaraxxus has two abilities that summon adds you need to deal with. The first one you have to deal with is the Nether Portal. The Nether Portal will continue to spawn Mistress of Pain until you have killed the portal. It's impossible in our gear to kill it before the first Mistress spawns, but you would prefer to kill it before the second Mistress spawns as they are quite annoying to deal with, especially as a caster. The reasoning for them being annoying as a caster is they have an ability called Mistress Kiss. When they apply this debuff to you, you will be silenced in the school of magic you were trying to cast for 8 seconds. As you can see in the video, I'm pretty much eating every single one of these and being silenced for 8 seconds every time on my shadow spells. This can however be avoided. If you have a proper UI that shows when they are casting on you, you can stop your current cast and instead cast something like Searing Pain to avoid the counter spell on shadow spells and instead get counterspelled on a fire spell. Proper weak auras for this will most likely be widely available for the launch of TOC. The next ability he does that summon adds is the Infernal Volcano. The volcano works like the nether portal, it will continue to spawn adds until you kill it. How much damage needs to focus on these things as an affliction warlock heavily depends on your raid. In some really good raids, you might barely be able to get your dots up on them, and maybe in worse raids you will be required to fully change your target to focus them down. There is no right answer for this, it fully depends on your raid. The infernals that spawn from the volcano works like any other infernal. They are tangible so they'll just be cleaved down on the boss. However, they have a channeled ability called Fell Inferno. They do where they pulse for heavy fire damage around them. If they charge you and do this ability, just move away from it to help your healers. That is about it for Jiraxis. I will share any good weak auras I find in my discord, as having good weak auras for this boss will be very valuable. Now towards everyone's favorite boss, Faction Champions. Now this boss is very special and very different from every other boss in the game. The best thing you can do for damage here. A Seed of Corruption is basically doesn't work as direct AOE abilities do heavily reduce damage on the fight, is to multi-dot the 2 to 3 focus targets you have. So if you have a first kill prior, second kill prior and a third kill prior, you can multi-dot these like you would on Mimron and Kologorn in Ulduar. It's a bit more messy here because of all the nameplates, but it can be done. That's about it I'll say for the damage part on this boss. On this boss, you can do a lot of other stuff to make the fight easier on your guild though. All the enemies like work like enemies would in PvP, which means the NPCs can be CC'd, but it will go on DR like in PvP. By that I mean the first fear you do will last 9 seconds, the second fear 6 seconds, third one 3 seconds, and then they will be immune to fear for 20 seconds. So what you can do as a warlock is have two main targets to be CC'd by you. This can be hard though, with the filthy death knights spamming their dots to everything. But what you can do is have a teamwork with a mage for example. So you fear a target three times and then when it's immune, you fear a second target three times. And when the first target goes immune from your fear, the mage can cover it with sheeps. 
and then the same thing on the second one. So the mob, the two mobs are basically perma CC'd by three fears into three sheeps and repeat. Curse of Tongues also work on all the caster mobs, most importantly the healers. You should always have a warlock keep these up, preferably the demo or the destruction warlock. Banish also works if you're against the rest of druid as tree form counts as an elemental form. Also don't forget you can banish the warlock's pet. If you are unlucky and being targeted by all of the NPCs like me in this video, you can do better than me. Have a nicely placed portal to get away from the NPCs and abuse the hunter's AOE slow trap to kite the mobs into them keeping them perma slowed. Other than that you can call for freedoms and bobs from the paladins making it easier for you to kite as well. That's about it with what I can think of for faction champions. The boss won't count towards your process according to Warcraft logs, which is also something we will cover at the end of the video. So just play for the team on this boss. Now, for what is probably the most fun fight as a warlock, especially affliction warlock, the twin Valkyr. Now, there are many strategies you can do on this boss, so I'm not going to go over how to play every single strategy, but instead go over how to absolutely maximize your DPS on this boss. Now, as you might know if you've read up on the mechanics of the boss or if you've done it in the past, on this boss you're fighting two Valkyrs, Aedes Darkbane and Fiola Lightbane. In the room you also have four portals you can click on, two light essence portals and two dark essence portals. Clicking on the dark essence grants you the dark essence debuff and it makes you do more damage to Fiola Lightbane. Clicking on the Light Essence grants you the Light Essence debuff and makes you do more damage to Aedes Darkbane. This is very important. The strategy from a DPS point of view I will now explain I didn't do in this video, as playing on 160 plus MS on the PTR made me not want to do it as an Affliction Warlock. But basically what you can do as an Affliction Warlock here is to snapshot a corruption on the Valkyrie you are not focusing at the beginning of the fight and then change color after you have done the snapshot. I will break this down as well as I can. So let's take the scenario of my guild raid here on the PTR. Everyone except the Sokers are playing with a dark debuff from the start. What you can do in this scenario is to start with the opposite color of the majority of the raid. In this case, start with a light debuff like the Sokers are. Then at the beginning of the fight, you snapshot your corruption on Aedes Darkbane, like you normally would. And then as soon as that corruption is up, you change to the Dark Essence to match the color of the raid. And you now snapshot a corruption with hopefully a good tricks, a good pre potted wild magic on Fjorda Lightbane. Now, the corruption you applied on Aedes Darkbane is doing full damage as long as you keep refreshing it with a drain or a shadow bolt. If you're well geared, you might as well choose a rank 1 shadow bolt because the target is taking less damage from you because you have the wrong color. Since with good gear, the rank 1 shadow bolt will GCD cap you anyway, like a drain would. And it now stacks up triple shadow embrace to make the corruption take harder as well. Now, I hope that was explained well enough and if you didn't quite understand it the first time, I recommend just winding it back and watching it one more time. I will also give you a cheat sheet on your screen with the steps you have to take in order to do this strategy as an Affliction Warlock. Now, we're not quite done with the snapshotting just yet. As you are soaking the balls in the room, you are gaining stacks. When you reach 100 stacks, you get a debuff on yourself that makes you do 100% more damage to one Valkyr. If you have the Dark Essence, it will make you do more damage to Fiola Lightbane. And if you have the Light Essence, it makes you do more damage to Aedes Darkbane. Now, take note. Does that 100% damage increase snapshot our corruption? Yes, it does. Even though it's not a flat 100% damage increase, but rather a 100% damage increase to a specific target, you can still snapshot it on your corruption. So you need to manually cast Corruption to gain this 100% damage increase. Be very careful with this, cause you will deal an insane amount of damage and build threat very fast 
and die like I do in my PTR attempts unless you shatter or call for a salvation. I will link the log from our TOC PTR raid, linking directly to the snapshot in the description down below so you can check it out yourself. I hope you will enjoy this boss as much as I do, it is definitely my favorite boss of TOC as an Affliction Warlock. Now for the last boss of the tier, Anubarak. There is a lot of stuff going on at Anub, so we will only discuss the things that actually affects us as Warlocks. The first important thing is that every 45 seconds, four Nerubian Borrowers will spawn with fixed spawn locations. Two will spawn in the southwest corner, and two will spawn in the southeast corner. These adds have an ability called Shadow Strike. If they finish this cast, they will shadow step and ambush one shot most people. The cast is interruptible with the Fell Hunter spell lock, and the adds are stunnable as well. When the adds are close to each other, they buff each other with haste. If you stack all four, the cast will be almost instant and impossible to interrupt. That is why you see us tanking them in clumps of two. However, feel free to scold your tanks if they are tanking them too far away from each other, so your seed is not hitting all four of them. In our raid, we chose to focus down these adds ASAP, because we felt it made the fight a lot easier. How much AoE you will be doing on them depends heavily on the raid you're in, and I can't tell you what you should do, that is up to the raid leader. When a new borrows, and during the borrow phase, swarm scarabs will be spawning. Just dot them all up, and by all means avoid them auto attacking you. They will fixate on random targets, so if you see you have aggro on one, just kite it. If they manage to hit you, you will receive a 60 second debuff that takes for damage. This debuff is especially dangerous when you get into the last phase of a noob. If you keep track of a noob, aka the spikes, during the burrow phase, you want to try and always position yourself far away from them so you have good reaction time if they choose to follow you. A well-placed portal and good uses of rocket boots can also help you kite the spikes longer. At 30%, a noob will go into his last phase and permanently affect you with leeching swarm, dealing a fixed percent of your current HP and healing a noob for an amount of the damage he dealt to you. When this happens, it is counterproductive to dot the adds with corruption, as corruption heals you and therefore heals the boss for more as well, making the kill slower. During the fight, a noob will also choose random targets to be affected by a frost debuff called Penetrating Cold, dealing heavy damage. Before 30%, this doesn't matter too much, but it can kill you in the last phase if the healers are a tad slow to get up your HP. If you get the debuff and you notice that your HP is very, very scary, stop what you're doing and cast Drain Life, use a Hellstone or even a Death Call, giving the healers a bit more reaction time to keep you alive. Be careful with life tapping when you have this debuff. If you are too low and do a max rank life tap, a tick of the frost debuff could kill you easily. Other than that, there isn't really much we can do from the Warlock perspective on this boss. The fight is mostly focused around tanking and healing. Now that we have gone over all the bosses and what you can do to min-max as a Warlock, let's talk about parsing in TOC, as I'm sure many are interested in this. On the screen, you can see the current rules as of one week before release by Warcraft Locks. When it comes to parsing, Stuff might change after the raid has come out and you'd have to stay updated on that on your own. On Northern Beasts, damage to everything counts as of right now and you have nothing to worry about. Same goes for Jiraxis. Faction Champions is the first boss we see with limitations and for this boss the limitation is that the boss just won't count at all for parsing and you don't have to worry about it at all. On Twin Valkyr, they will most likely normalize Empowered Darkness and Empowered Light, which means the bonus 100% damage from this won't count in the parse. On Anuba Rack, the damage dealt towards the Nerubian Borrowers once Phase 3 has started do not count, which means padding on them in Phase 3 won't do you any good. Damage done to the Swarm Scarus do not count at all. These are the ones that spawn while Anuba Rack is burrowed. 
Warcraft Logs says the damage done to Nerubian borrowers will likely get capped, but as of the date of this video, it isn't. There currently isn't an article out yet by Warcraft Logs, so I cannot link to this. You will however find these past limitations in the Warcraft Logs Discord under Wrath Announcements. Now, let's talk about BIS lists for Affliction Warlocks in TOC. There is a mathematical BIS that most people agree on is the BIS list you should go for in TOC. However, I personally will not be going for this exact BIS list. The mathematical BIS list is made assuming you are fighting a patchwork style fight. No multi-dotting, no seeding, no anything like this. This is one of the main reasons I won't be going for it. In the Sims for the BIS gear, crit loses a lot of value during execute phase and therefore it doesn't like crit too much. However, it does not account for how good crit is when you're multi-dotting and when you're doing AoE. Now when I mention AoE, there is not much of this in TOC. The only AoE I can think of really is some seeds at Tyraxis and some seeds on the Anub ads. However, my main focus is not on TOC but rather to prep and get ready for ICC where there is a lot of seeding to be done on trash and multi-dotting to be done. Because of this, I have chosen to replace my abyss from being Barb of Tarask to Mortalis. And in losing the hit rating from Barb, I changed my boots to boots of Icy Flow to make up for the lost hit. This set has 0.3% more haste, but more importantly 1.3% more crit rating and what you're losing is 7 spell power and 76 spirit. Second reason, and also an important reason for this, is that Barb of Tarask is a weapon that can be used by every single caster in the raid. The Shadow Priest, the Boomkin, Elemental Shaman, Warlocks, Mages. On the other hand, you have Mortalis for the Horde players. And this is a weapon that uh, basically is only wanted by Mages and Warlocks, since Holy Paladins have their Valonirs most likely at this point. It makes for a smoother loot situation for the guild, where you can give barb to the people that weren't fortunate enough to see Mortalis drop in their raids, or the spell power mace for the boomy elemental shaman and shadow priest. It's a, just a very flexible dagger. The difference in DPS in these two setups is also very, very minimal, and you will never notice it, as you can see on this sim. The sim settings are very default while the sim number might be very different from the other sims, but that doesn't matter when we are comparing the two sets to each other. Now I thought I would show you in real time here, as, more, as real as it gets, how close these two sets actually are to each other. So we have the tier 9 mathematical bis, and we have the bis that I am going for. As you can see the only thing that changes is the boots and the weapon. Now if we go to the sim, we have the mathematical bis one here with Barb of Tarask and the Sandals of the Morning Widow. If we sim that... Now I only do 5000 iterations here. You should probably do 100,000 if you want to be as safe as possible. But this is fine for now. I have done many iterations before and it's usually very very close to each other anyway with the results. So this is fine for now. Now this is the mathematical bis one. Now if we change to the other setup. We're going Mortalis, we're changing the gem because we get a nice socket bonus for that. We change the boots to the icy flow. And now we can change a gem in our pants from being with hit to being with haste instead. And we're still hit capped. Now if we sim this one instead, this is the result. Now this is the difference of 6 DPS. You will never notice a difference of 6 DPS when you are doing 12,200. And I'm even using the wrong sim settings. I haven't set anything up. I'm not even putting in sappers and deasing the trinkets or using proper spell power buff and all this stuff. So this is a very low number. We will do way higher if I use the correct sim settings. But the difference between the two sets are still 6 DPS. You will never notice it. So which is also why I don't mind going for Mortalis and the Icy Flow instead. It is completely fine. The items of biggest value depends a lot on your current gear. Not everyone was fortunate enough to get full best from Ulduar. However, 
If I had to say what the most important things are, it would be getting the 4 set 258 items, get the Skyweaver vestment to complement this setup, and then getting your main hand weapon. Some other slots are very minimal. If you for example compare your new Biss Bracers, the difference is 6 Bell Power, 5 Haste and you even lose 1 Spirit. Because you lose a socket bonus. So if you have the hard mode XT Bracers, this is a slot you don't really care about. Rather give these Anoop Bracers to someone who has not been fortunate enough to get the XT ones. A slot like the build is a lot more value for example. If you currently have the Algalon build, as you lose a build with no haste in favor for a build with haste. If you want to be incredibly sure of exactly what items are your biggest, I would recommend you to import your gear to the Warlock sim and sim individual upgrades yourself. The cloak will be a huge discussion point in TOC. The spell power, haste and crit one is your best but you would be very happy with the spell power, haste and spirit one as well. They are incredibly close to each other within single digit DPS. Personally, I will go for the crit version all I can because of the same reasoning regarding me choosing the sword instead of the dagger. I'm just a big fan of the crit. And there you have it. That, that is pretty much all I have for the video. I hope the video has helped you in any way possible and if not, I'm sorry. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to comment on the video or find me on twitch.tv slash technotv. Other than that, best of luck in TOC and may the loot guards be ever in your favor.